and Ken Adams for reading that beautiful poetry. Mm -hmm. I am, um, as Larry said, uh, primarily a science reporter. I, uh, for many years, have been writing about the process of research. I'm currently, my day job, writing about a group of scientists who study large-scale human rights violations around the world. And I'm researching and writing a lot about atrocities. Fortunately for me, I am also very, very lucky to be part of a thriving and beautiful psychedelic community. And I've been a member of psychedelic community in some form for the last 40 years. And um, I just feel like I won the jackpot on that. The psychedelic community has supported me as an artist and it has given me great strength and inspiration. And I'm very fortunate to know people like Ken and, and other members of this community. I am really grateful for that. So I want to today tell you folks a story about this uh, art project that I started three years ago. I, um, I'm an artist. I, uh, I work in a lot of different mediums. I uh, particularly like what I call community performance art. And I had this idea about three years ago. I thought to myself, you know, I often find myself in strange out of the way places, at festivals and events, music festivals, arts festivals, and Sometimes I find myself wandering around these events and really what I like to do is to sit down and have a nice cup of tea. Because I, I think my grandmother was right. You know, if, if you get a little sideways or tired or cranky, it's really just good to sit down and have a nice warm cup of tea, hydrate, and, um, and gather yourself up a little bit. And I think that's especially true for people in non-ordinary states of consciousness. Now, in a lot of festivals, there's a lot of beautiful art and loud music and dancing and all sorts of things going on. But I thought to myself, you know, I have this idea. I think what I'd like to do is to create a space at music and arts festivals where people can go to have a nice, cup of tea, sit down, a quiet conversation with a supportive and empathetic person, perhaps take a nap, get out of the sun, get warm, and have a space to integrate and reflect on their psychedelic and visionary experiences. So one of the things I really like about working with psychedelic substances is that I think over four decades almost of working with these materials, it has helped me to manifest things in my life that I really want to do. So I have this artistic idea, and artists, you know, there's always the dark night of the soul as an artist. You always have this idea, and part of you is always saying, that will never work. You know, you can't do that or, you know, forget about it. You know, you don't have the resources, whatever. So, I'm going to tell you a story today about how I created this piece of art and the community that's now part of this piece of art that works with me to create this experience. So, this is my first slide because at the beginning of a piece of art, you're just blue sky in it. You know, you're looking up at the sky and you're saying, I have this idea, you know, help me. Right? It's good to ask for help. And somebody asked earlier about what adjunct to psychedelic experiences can we talk about? And for me, it's prayer. I just, I come from a church family. What can I say? You know, people around here are church people. Um, and, and I'm not necessarily a church person myself, but I just sat down and I, I prayed. And I said, you know, help, give me some help, give me some inspiration. And, um, and lo and behold, out of this blue sky inspiration came this image to me of Saraswati. Saraswati, for those of you who don't know her, is the Hindu goddess of cosmic knowledge. 
and beauty and art and transformative understanding. She sits, you know, there by her peacocks on a swan and she plays music. And uh, so I, in my meditation, I took this image and I decided that I was going to form a tea house called the Saraswati Tea House. And I had this idea and uh, I decided that a great place to start creating this tea house would be the Burning Man Festival that takes place every year in the Nevada desert because it's a very challenging place. There's no infrastructure, there are no resources, you have to bring in everything and create something from nothing. You have to manifest your idea fully in a sustainable way and then leave no trace, right? It's a great challenge for an artist, which is why so many artists work at that festival. So I had this idea, I thought, huh, I will create a tea house. And one of the first things I realized I was gonna need is a structure. In, in my case, I researched and I, I decided that the, the best structure that I could get together and expensively <coughs> were Costco carports, that they had canvas structures with metal frames and I collected a bunch of donated Oriental rugs and pillows and, and some teapots and some tea boilers and I packed it all into my truck and um, uh, and, and that's uh, parked in Haight-Ashbury. I'm a proud resident of Haight-Ashbury, America's first psychedelic neighborhood. And um, it helps if you're going to do a really logistically intensive project to own a big-ass truck. Okay? <laughs> I'm kind of an urban cowgirl. I have a horse, you know. You have a horse, you have a trailer, you have a trailer, and you got to have a big truck. And you got to know how to haul things. So there I am, next to my truck ready to head out, you know, to who knows where, out into the middle of the desert. Yo, there we are, <laughs> heading out to the middle of the desert with all this gear and this art idea, right? It's, I'm an artist, I'm gonna go out and create a piece of community art. So there we are, heading, that's the access road, onto the Black Rock Desert where the Burning Man Festival is held every year. I'm sure many of you have probably been there. So, there's a, me, my truck, a lot of beautiful open land. I love that land. And you get there and there's a bunch of other trucks and, you know, not much else. People are creating their art out there as well. And we, we get to this spot in the middle of the playa, which is our designated location for our tea house. So that's all that's there, right? It's a beautiful blank canvas, right, to create with. And so I thought, you know, beings and entities help me create a piece of art in the middle of nowhere with no infrastructure. So I went to my psychedelic community and I said, help me create this tea house. And we formed a camp um, to, you know, go to Burning Man and be in family. And members of the camp said, okay, I'll, we'll help you create this tea house. So, <laughs> there we are. We're, we're in the process of unpacking our truck. And, uh, and we're sitting around, that's the tea bar that I decided we needed. Because I really wanted to create an alternative space that did not serve alcohol, that offered the same social um, excitement that a bar would. Now, as many of you know, Psychedelic substances and alcohol often do not mix. It's a not a good combination. So I really wanted to create a space that was alcohol free, a, a place for community integration and transformation, but I, I wanted a bar. So I, I created a, a tea bar, and there we are sitting in the middle of our, of our space with nothing around us, looking at our tea bar, going, okay, let's build a tea house. So, so we start unpacking our giant budget truck and uh, pulling our trailers in that we're going to live in and uh, we sit around and figure out how we're going to do it. And of course, in the meantime, people are building incredible pieces of art around us, like the temple. Amazing structures, you know, it's a little intimidating when people are creating things like this yeah. out there and you're in the process of saying, okay, I'm an artist, let's create something here. So 
We start assembling these Costco car barns that I have bought secondhand, and uh, it's hot, and we're all slightly dehydrated, you know, we're acclimating, it's the high desert, we're at altitude, it's hard work, right? And we're hauling stuff around, and you know, other people are building things around us, and we start to build our camp, and you can see there now the corner of one of the first car barns that, that we're putting up to create the tea house. I bought these car barns on Amazon. I had them delivered to my doorstep. They were cheap, they were strong, they could withstand heavy winds, they weren't terribly ugly, and we could put them up without an enormous amount of fuss. So we start erecting these car barns, and we start putting four of them together to form roughly a 1,200 square foot space. And you can see all the stuff, you know, that we're lugging around. We've got those big trash cans that are full of rebar. We had to rebar the sucker down because there are high winds out there. And, and, and we're bringing in all sorts of gear. It was a logistically really intense experience and still is. I've learned a lot about logistics running a build crew, let me tell you. And then we start to create an interior, and you can see the tea bar is there. And we start to lay down these secondhand rugs that I've purchased, and, 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 and some, put some things together, and create this space. And while we're creating this space, we're out there for a week building this tea house before the event starts. And so while we're building the tea house, the tea house becomes our build crew's clubhouse because it's the first structure there, right? So this iteration of the tea house, this is our dining room table. We're feeding our crew, and we're using the tea house as our clubhouse, as our eating and sleeping space while we build the rest of the tea house and the entire camp. And so we keep building, and, and there we are having a meal. There are members of our crew. <laughs> There's me going, yeah, I think it's time to eat, folks. Remember, you know, armies move on their stomachs. Eat, hydrate, rest. And we start bringing in all of these rugs that people have donated. I'm now the proud owner of 25 donated Oriental rugs. Come and help me. I had to rent a storage space in Oakland, right, to put them all in. We've got giant teddy bears. Now, the things in these things in the foreground are uh, hot water boilers. and they're electric, and you plug them in, and we get hot water on demand, which is how we create the hot water for the tea house. And we just start putting the tea house together. You can see the basins behind you. Uh, I'm the daughter of a public health nurse, and I believe in washing our teacups. Not everybody in the tea community believes this, but, you know, Mom's a public health nurse, we wash our teacups and we use those basins to do a very simple three-part washing system. It's, you know, community public health. So we create our tea house and of course we create an altar because we're creating a sacred space. We're, we're creating a transformative cauldron for people, to hold people. And naturally I put a, you know, an image of Sarah Swabby riding the swan and that's our build crew's version of the altar that people are putting various things on. And there we have it. You know, we created this tea house and, and we opened before the event opened and the people who were all building art around us during the build week all started to show up and, and they're like, great, where's the tea? You know, the event hasn't even opened yet. So we open and we just start serving tea and holding space. Now, it's important to note here that the people who are serving tea are all volunteers. Basically, I went to my psychedelic community and I said, who here wants to hold space and be present and serve tea and empathy for our friends? And the first year I did this, about 50 people said, I can do that, I'll join you. And they did. And we had dust storms, and those dust storms that year, and people started serving tea. The thing I like about tea service, there's several things I like about tea service. One, it's a multi-generational thing. You know, a lot of music and arts festivals are very segregated by age. It, it, a lot of it comes down to the music that you're listening to. <laughs> but 
people of all ages can serve tea. These beautiful women, not on this side of the tea table, but on the other side, are older women in my community, and they're serving tea beautifully. Fair for people. So people would just roll up on their bicycles or walk in, and they would sit down at the tea table, and we would serve them tea. And this is the view out of the tea house, and a lot of people came there to read and rest and sleep. We always had a sleeping space so that people could come and rest during the day if they were tired, if they were in a non-ordinary state of consciousness, if they needed a space, a safe, quiet space to rest and integrate. There are very few of these spaces at festivals, you'd be amazed. And so I really felt it was important to give people a really safe place to rest and to integrate their experiences. And the people that I chose to serve tea, I really, you know, went out to my community and I said, you are a beautiful, present, compassionate person. Some of them were counselors. Some of them were uh, people with other skills, people with medical credentials, people without medical credentials, but they all, each of them had a presence to them, a calmness. They were grounded people, and they helped the people who were coming in to drink tea with us ground and center themselves. Which I think is really one of the larger purposes of a tea house. But you can see there in the background our schedule. Scheduling ships of people to do this service is challenging. We run a tea house 24-7 for two weeks up there, it takes a lot of people. The people who step up and do this work are people I'm really honored to know. They're really beautiful. They do it with great mindfulness. And they sit with you. One of the great things about coming and drinking tea is that you don't need to say anything, right? You don't need to say anything. You can just come and sit down next to the tea server you see that we serve in a modified gung fu Chinese style on these beautiful wooden tea trays and little tiny cups with relatively small glass teapots and pitchers. So we pour from the glass teapot into the pitcher and then from the pitcher into your teacup. It's a ritual. And we need a ritual in our community. It's a grounding ritual. And if you come in and you're feeling unsettled, and all you want to do is sit down next to a kind person and have someone pour you a cup of tea it can really be very useful to help ground you. You don't need to say anything. We serve uh, excellent pu'er and also herbal teas. We now buy lots and lots of tea. Formed a buyer's club. We buy thousands of dollars worth of tea now. We've just formed a buyer's club with other tea houses. We get it from a, an amazing tea importer named David Lee Hoffman of Marin. Uh, I went to Chinatown and got some beautiful teacups. Those are our house teacups. Those are the teapots that we pour out of, herbal teas are poured out of glass pots, clay pots hold the pu'er or the aged Chinese black tea that we pour. There are some pu'er pots there, the clay pots. So we take the water from the water boilers, put it into thermoses, and then pour from the thermoses into the teapots, from the teapots into the pitchers, and from the pitchers into the cups. It's a water ritual. It's a calming, renewing research ritual. When I say research, we, we thought about like what kind of what kind of ritual could we do that would be most calming and soothing and grounding and comforting for people in the desert and that needed to involve water. You know? Thought a lot about this. So there's our schedule at the very beginning of the of the week. It takes a lot of people to do this. Every year we have more and more people. This year we had about 150 people on our crew and a camp of about 200 people. And, um, and a lot of different people pour tea. 
a lot of different people. People who have graduated from this school have poured tea for us. And we're very grateful for their time. So after being on the Playa, then we went to decompression. We took the, we started taking the tea house out. This is in San Francisco. And uh, this is out in Dog Patch, where they have the decompression event. And we, we took the tea house on the road. We, we would just set up somewhere, in this case, in the middle of this parking dog patch, and start pouring tea. And, uh, and we, were, we were really swamped, um, just about everywhere. You can see our very simple setup. This photo was taken from a, a um, holiday party. We started serving at holiday parties. We served at memorial services. We, we went on the street. We put our tea house on our backpacks and served at most of the Occupy demonstrations in uh, Oakland and in San Francisco. We just set up in the middle of the road to get a lookout to figure out where the cops are and if we're about to be, you know, run over by a crowd or a group of police. And we, we set up right in the middle of the road and served at Occupy. It's often cold and raining and people are dehydrated. It's a very good service. We can serve anywhere. This is at a holiday party where we, uh, we kicked off this idea of having a topless tea house. And something amazing happened. Our tea servers, some of the tea servers were topless. And, and what happened at this holiday party is everybody else at the party took their shirts off, too. I never anticipated. <laughs> of course, it was in San Francisco, so you know. Yeah, so then we went and we took our tea house to Symbiosis. These are some of our beautiful, amazing tea servers at the Symbiosis Festival. This is the second year, and this year I decided that because we had formed a circle, a community around this tea house, that it was really time to, to change the name. So I changed it to the Full Circle Tea House. And it was a full circle, with a full circle of community around us. And these are some of our tea servers. This is during the full solar eclipse right out near Pyramid Lake in Nevada. We brought our tea house there. Very difficult logistical situation, even harder than Burning Man in some regards. Logistically really, really tough. We bring in all of our own water, all of our own food, all of our own power, we run generators, we bring in gasoline. It's really a huge logistical operation. And, and in this case, we set up right next to the medical tent. And we were the medical tent's waiting area and discharge unit. And then we'd take tea and we'd serve tea to the medical people who really needed some tea because they had their hands full. Yeah, that was, that was quite the week. Yeah, there's a, one of our tea servers, amazingly beautiful, conscious, lovely, incredible people serving with us 24-7. With real integrity, holding space while people slept and integrated. We work with medical people, we work with rangers, we work with the MTs. Everybody comes in and serves tea and is present. Lots of people there. You see, we set up our Saraswati shrine, even though we had changed our name. We used the, the end of Zen Swoosh as our logo now. Serving tea, so simple, but it's not simple, you know? And that's what we do. Now, I like this image. This image is from the Louvre in, in Paris. It's, uh, it's from Greece. And the reason I have this image in here is that I, one of the reasons that I could do this work is because I have a really strong community of psychedelic women who stand with me to do this work. Uh, about seven years ago, I, uh, I went to the World Psychedelic Forum in Basel, Switzerland, as a reporter for Wired News, and I couldn't help but notice that there were 80 men speaking and six women. And I thought, well, that's odd, because I know all of these amazing psychedelic women. And you know the old adage, if you want to change the world, throw a better party? Mm -hmm. So I threw a party, and I invited 25 women and a couple of men to come and speak. I just inverted what usually happens at psychedelic gatherings. And, um, and before we know it, we, uh, we had a nonprofit organization and, and an event that now holds uh, an annual 
gathering for women who study non-ordinary states of consciousness. It's always been open to men, or as we like to say in San Francisco, people of all genders. Mm -hmm. And um, and they really stand behind me. It's in a really amazing community. It's a thriving, lively, caring community of psychedelic women and men. And um, we just had a gathering in Vancouver, Canada. We're now international because a lot of people can't get visas to come to the US. So we had to go international, which we are now. This is, uh, you know, women have always been involved in fighting prohibition. This is, of course, from the end of alcohol prohibition. I like this image a lot. This is our logo. This is called the Lorenz Manifold. It's a mathematical interpretation of chaos theory and was crocheted by a women mathematician in Bristol, England. I quite like it. And there's some imagery from our group. That's a piece of art from Martina Hoffman, one of the many artists who's presented at our event. We include artists, researchers, healers, activists, priestesses. There's an altar that we created in the tea house that we built at one of our women's visionary congresses. We have it at IONS, the Institute of Noetic Sciences in Petaluma. Beautiful altar, really lovely. And uh, there's my friend David serving tea in our tea house there at the Women's Visionary Congress. About a fourth of the people who go are identify as men. There's me serving tea. Uh, and some of our beloved friends who have presented at the Women's Visionary Congress, the WBC and Sasha Shulgin. Uh, other friends who are friends and allies with Sasha and his lab. Martina Hoffman, the amazing psychedelic artist who has presented many times. There she is with her beautiful husband who is now in the other realms, Robert Venosa, who gave his last presentation at our event. Beautiful art. This is a piece of art by Penny Slinger, many artists present. Just amazing women. Annie Sprinkle, the amazing artist with her partner Beth. Carolyn Ferris, also an amazing psychedelic artist. Carol Randall, another amazing psychedelic artist and member of the Brotherhood of Eternal Love. I'm always amused by when people think that the psychedelic community started with Timothy Leary and Terence McKenna. It just makes me, just makes me smile. Mm -hmm. Women have always been, you know, involved in this community. Plant women have been using plants to alter their consciousness for thousands of years, but we had to go underground for the reasons that you would imagine. The incredible researcher, Alicia Danforth, who has worked with Charlie Grove on the Harvard UCLA psilocybin studies. Uh, my fellow board members, Diana Slattery, and Joanna Harcourt Smith, Timothy Leary's ex wife, who just published a very interesting book. Highly recommend you read it. Uh, other women, the woman to the right, is also a fellow board member, WBC treasurer Maria Mangini, nurse midwife. Ah, oh, some other amazing women, Magenta and our friend uh, Dr. Natalie Metz. Remember me. This is uh, our crew from the Women's Visionary Congress. This is part of my psychedelic community, alive and thriving. Very much so. Hmm? And yet we keep our egos in check. This is from the playa. It's very important to keep it all in check. I love this piece of art. This, this on fire. Really, it was awesome. <laughs> so we go back to the playa, and dust covers everything, covers all of our tea stuff, all of our altars. We have dust storms, endless logistical challenges. And we're pouring tea all through it, just pouring tea. That's what our tea house looked like this year. It's beautiful. So beautiful. So there you are walking across some desert, some festival, and maybe you're in a non-ordinary state of consciousness, and you see a light out there in the distance, and you think, wow, maybe I can lie down for a second and integrate this experience. And 
Maybe somebody will pour me a nice cup of tea. And look, they've got some tea bars set up. And maybe I could sit on the floor, or maybe sit in a chair, maybe I could take a nap. Because it's the playa, we have to evaporate all of our water. We've learned a lot about engineering water. We bring in about 600 gallons of water. We evaporate about 60 gallons of water a day with the epitrons off the top of our truck. We can't dump water on the playa, so we need to engineer our own systems, which we do. Beautiful. It was beautiful. It was really beautiful. And this year, because we have a quest to hydrate people, we started an elixir bar. It's one of our elixirs. Um, bubbly water, essential oils, and a slice of lime. Delicious. And a little salt. We have something called the hydration martini. Very good to rehydrate people in the middle of the desert. What do people need, you know, out there? They, most people get into trouble not because they necessarily taken too much of something, although certainly people do that, or mixed it with something else, although that certainly happens as well. But it's, people are dehydrated. I consider what we do risk reduction. I don't like the term harm reduction because it assumes that all use is harmful, and I don't think that's true. So in our risk reduction strategy, we now have elixirs. And you can come at the bar and say, hi, I want a hydration martini. Thank you very much. I'm really thirsty. And we will serve you an awesome hydration martini with a smile. You light it all up. The guy to the left is a guy named Fritz, and he's one of our tea masters. We have some really amazing people who serve with us. This year, we worked with the Zendo Project, which is sponsored by MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies. They had a, a Zendo, which is a very a dedicated space run by the woman to, my, to the right here, Lene Ponti. And um, we were on one side of the city with the tea house, and the Zendo was on the other side of the city. And David Bronner, bless his heart, of the Bronner Soap people, sponsored a shuttle between our tea house and the Zendo. So that if you were at the tea house and you needed more intensive one-on-one -on -one care with counselors at the Zendo, you could jump aboard our trip shuttle and take a trip across the city, get compassionate, informed, one-on-one -on -one care, and then get back on the shuttle, come back to our tea house to integrate, hang with your friends and have a nice cup of tea. Yeah. Worked beautifully and had a great time. Those people worked really hard. They're great people. Thank you, Max, for doing that. We'll probably do that again next year. Yeah, so there we are on the playa, just having a great time. You know, it's me to the right, the playa where? We're all just like, we have to remember to have fun in service. You have to have fun. You have to, you have to bring, you know, your, your psychedelic awareness to it. Passion. And people do. You know. I estimate that this year on the playa we serve between four and five thousand people in two weeks of continuous twenty-four hour service. It, we blocked it, really. We were exhausted. But we did it. And then we picked ourselves up oh two weeks later and we went to symbiosis again, which that took just about all the rest of our energy. I think we're all still recovering from that. And uh, I, I wanted to include this, uh, this photo. This is Roland, um, a researcher with the Hector Group. Um, this is uh, next door to the tea house this year. We uh, had the Palenque Norte speaker series. It was all part of the same camp. And so many psychedelic elders and researchers um, like Roland came and spoke, so people could come, and, and, and Ken Adams also spoke, and there were a number of many other really wonderful speakers who came and spoke, and you could hear the speaker, and then go next door for tea, and then go and, you know, hear the speakers again. I'm sorry, I had to put that in. <laughs> Ken hanging out in the tea house with us. It was great. It was a great time. 
Yep. And uh, sleeping is very, very important. And you can see that there's our schedule. Help. Please volunteer. Sign up for tea service. People did. See, we have about four or five people on shift. We run four six-hour shifts, 24-7 for 14 days. Imagine how much work that is. It's really important to take care of your crew. The first rule of triage, and really, you know, part of what we do is triage, is to take care of yourself and your crew. And so we really work hard at making sure that our crew are supported. We have to support each other as a psychedelic community. It's absolutely essential. We stand or we fall together. That's the interior of my trailer, which kind of messy. We're in the middle of the burn. But the reason I'm showing this is that this is our clubhouse. And the people on our crew got too tired, too exhausted, came back from their own journeys, needed a place to chill out in private. We always have a space for them. And we always have a one-on-one -on -one space behind the tea house to work with people who need some privacy as well. That's Pez. He and I ran our Burning Man camp this year. We've now officially retired from running Burning Man camps. It was my third year co-running a Burning Man camp in addition to running the tea house. And uh, he and I ran what we thought was a, the best Burning Man camp we've ever been in. But after 18 years of going to Burning Man every single year, it's the end of my running Burning Man camps at least. But, he runs the Palenque Norte Speaker Series, and so we're just going to pursue our respective art projects. And, and it's important not to burn yourself out. You have to raise your successors. So we have trained our successors, and we have passed on the running of our Burning Man camp to, some, to a very competent man and woman. I think it's important to have gender balance in all big projects, and we all do. And there's our teardown crew. We're exhausted. We're filthy. We're Starving. We took the last of our took the last of our watermelons and we just started to carve them up and you know because we had to get ourselves off the pile. We're surrounded by law enforcement, which had a very intense presence out there this year. We had to go through this gauntlet of police just to get off site. And so we gathered up our food and, and we sat in a circle and we we asked for a blessing to keep us all safe. We shared some watermelon, and um, and we all got off the plow safely. It's the most dangerous thing we do is drive home after tearing everything down and packing it up. Yeah, that's me and Plower. And here's our crew. What an amazing group of people. You know, after two weeks, and this is just a, a fraction of our crew, mind you. They're about. 150 people total, but this is this is part of our core crew. Really great folks to create that for that many people. So I want to just say a couple more things. You know, artists they they want their work to live on, and and I want this work to live on. I'm, you know, a junior elder. I'm kind of in, in Ken's crew. So, um, so I've really tried to encourage other people to form their own tea houses. I've covered the open source software movement as a tech reporter for years, and I, I see this as a piece of open source culture. And I want other people to be able to, to create a tea house of their own. And since I started this three years ago, there are now six spin-off tea houses that have been created by other people. And everyone does it slightly differently, which is beautiful. And nature loves diversity, right? So there's now a tea house in Paris, France. There's one in Austin, Texas. There's one out here in Oakland. There's one in Philadelphia, my hometown. There's one in New York City. And, uh, and, and they're all different, but, but each of them shares some um, different qualities. They each really make an effort to create a sacred space for personal transformation. 
And they always give away their tea and water. We never charge for anything we ever do. It's always free. And we just raise money to do it, or we dip into our own pockets. There's always an element of ritual to it. In our case, the tea ceremony. There's always an element of ritual to center and ground people. There is always a, a community that comes together to create it. And, um, and in my case, I, I always make sure, because I come from a medical family, that, that we always have somebody on staff, and ideally somebody on every shift who has CPR and advanced first aid training, and ideally EMT training. We recruit counselors with professional counseling skills. We try to make sure there's always somebody on shift who does that. I thought myself, maybe I should maybe I should go and pursue a counseling degree at a place like CIS. And I decided really in the end what I needed was an EMT certification. Because my greatest concern is somebody coming to the tea house, sleeping, throwing up, aspirating, and you know, dying inside the tea house. It's, it happens. And because people come there to sleep, and so so we, we're keeping an eye on the sleeping people. We put people in recovery positions if it looks like they're really intoxicated. Yes, we need counselors, but if you have it in you, go get your EMT certification. Become a psychedelic EMT, we need you. And then uh, finally, I want to say something about a, a writing project that I've been involved in for the past four years. I've been involved in a international writing project that um, involves about 50 people um, in countries all around the world. We have online been writing a document called The Manual of Psychedelic Support, a comprehensive guide to establishing and facilitating practical care services at music festivals and other events. There are about 50 writers, there are six editors, I'm one of the editors. It's going to be released early next year under a Creative Commons um, non-commercial attribution license, which means it can be copied and distributed and retransmitted and added to. It's a living document. And it will be released on a website. Um, there are four words in the, uh, in the manual by Sam Cutler, who's the former tour manager of the Rolling Stones and the Grateful Dead, and Diego Riva, who's the founder of the Boom Festival. And the chapters in this manual are, are what you would kind of expect a manual like this would have. It has a chapter on the history of psychedelic care services, principles and ethics of psychedelic support, legal considerations, planning and first steps for a new project, recruiting a team, supporting roles, building and training a team, logistics, creating a care space, running the service, screening your servers, complementary therapies, team welfare, working with other organizations. I, I want to point out that this tea house is about an eight minute slow walk and about a four minute fast walk from a medical station. And we train our tea service to be alert for people with any medical needs. And we don't try to provide medical services ourselves. If we see anybody who seems to be in distress, either we walk them over to the medical station and have them evaluate them, or we ask them to go and get help and hopefully they're with friends who can help them. So it's important to, to work out an arrangement with the local medical services at events. And there's a whole chapter on working with other organizations. Um, there's a chapter on, on research and um, uh, some of the things that you can learn about psychedelic care. Um, risk management and performance improvement, case studies, online resources and other assistance. There's an appendix on drug effects and interactions and another appendix on uh, street names for commonly encountered psychedelics because those street names are always changing. And I want to give a shout out to the Arrowwood Library they're great librarians. It's the best drug library that I'm aware of. They've come and they've spoken at the Women's Visionary Congress for several years. Even they can't keep up with all the new materials being released. And neither can we. Every time we go to a festival, there's a new substance that someone's taking. And we do our best to 
educate ourselves. Erowid.org, E-R-O-W-I-D.org. So, I think I'd like to stop talking now and take some questions. How am I doing on time there? Uh, you're good. You're right about good. Go for you talk for another one minute is, is about what we were set up anyway. So, well done. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. All right. So, does anybody have any questions? I don't, I don't have a question, but I certainly have an extraordinary chance. This is truly amazing. I had never realized public health could be art. <clears throat> Thank you. That's an amazing compliment. Yes. Yes, it is a piece of public health art. Genius home. is bringing two things together that mm -hmm. have never been brought together. Mm -hmm. Or coming up with something no one seemingly has thought about or reason before. You have. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You know, I want to say that I'm writing the chapter on the history of psychedelic services for this manual. I'm working on it right now. I'm going to go back home tonight and do some work on it. We stand on the shoulders of many other people who have done this work for years. Let me list them. The Rainbow family has been providing a care space since 1972. The innumerable parking lot medics who went on tour with the Grateful Dead for years and years, created care spaces in parking lots, often inside of buses. Rock Medicine still takes care of people at large events here in San Francisco. White Bird out of Eugene, Oregon, has not only created a medic service and provides care like this, but does primary care for people in their communities, which is an incredible thing. Then, of course, there are the many other uh, festivals and event care services in Europe. The one that's best known is the Boom Festival in Portugal, where they set up an amazing care space there, really uh, stellar. And they don't have the law enforcement pressure that we do here in this country. And so they're able to do on-site drug testing to determine what is it that you just took. You know, that would be an enormous step for public health. That would be something that could be very useful here in this country. And then there, there are other more contemporary services, you know, of course the Zendo project that we work with, the, um, the Burning Man Rangers run a sanctuary space at Burning Man, I've worked with them in the past, they do a good job of that. Um, there are a lot of other very thoughtful people who have been doing this work and part of the effort that we put into doing a manual that is constantly updated online and accessible to everybody is to bring this knowledge together and keep updating the manual and make it free and available to everybody because there's there's a lot of knowledge that we can draw upon. Other questions? Yes, Ken. How can people here help? Well, wow. If you would like to work in a tea house, please let me know. Our next event, uh, we're doing a private party um, on November 23rd, um, bringing in a tea house into a giant mansion in Napa Valley, where we're having a, we're, we're serving a private event, um, and we're fully staffed for that. But um, We'll be doing other events and festivals. We, we normally, this time of year, take a, a little break. We're tired. We were on the road from May until September, and we also have day jobs, mind you. So, um, so we're not really ramping up to do a big, big event anytime soon, but if you'd like to work with us for another event, please let me know. I'd be happy to take your contact information and uh, we do two trainings a day in the tea house to train tea servers. Um, we train at noon and midnight, so we get people on whatever schedule you're on. And, um, and we'd be happy to have your assistance, your support, your good wishes, your wisdom, your suggestions. Get in touch with me, and we'd be honored to have the CIS community work with us.
Yes. Uh, is the uh, Women's Visionary Congress open to people? Absolutely, yes. It is open to everybody. Um, we just came back from our last event in Vancouver, Canada, which was just a couple of weeks ago. Very strong psychedelic community in Vancouver, Canada. Big shout out, especially to Van Du, the Vancouver Drug Users Union, the first people to get safe injection sites for IV drug users. Way to go, wish we could get it here. We really support the, the risk reduction communities in Canada because they've been so far ahead of us. They came and spoke and so uh, our next event is going to be in May. We're going to have an event um, outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico. You can go to visionarycongress.org to find out about that. And then we do our annual event every year in June at the Institute of Noetic Sciences in Petaluma. And there's information on our website about that as well. Open to all genders and some terrific speakers. Ralph Metzner spoke this year and gave a beautiful talk. Jane Strait, the great botanist. Kat Harrison has spoken for years. We started a, a fund uh, to help support the work of um, women in this community and, and Kat received one of our grants in the past years. She's of course an amazing ethnobotanist and artist. Any other questions? Okay, thank you so much for coming to hear about the keynote.